today on an instructional edition of Fixing the Money Thing. If you stay humble and you let the Holy Spirit deal with your attitudes and keep you in the love walk, He's going to bless you. God's correction is not to make you feel bad about yourself. It's to help you get where you need to get. Gary's introducing us to the other side of faith today on Fixing the Money Thing. So many Christians don't get that part. They trust God, so to speak. They're looking for God to do things, but they don't know their responsibility to make sure it works together. This is the principle of Newton's law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. We have to know how this thing works to enjoy the benefits of the kingdom. The pressure and speed of the hot gases provide the force needed to turn the turbines and its shell. You gotta be involved in this process. God wants you to have every promise, but there's a part you play in it. Do something. The Other Side of Faith is the series we're in. What is that? The Other Side of Faith. You're on the other side of faith. It's your part. You and God together. So you need to talk about that, don't we? Well, we're going to anyway. So we're going to talk about it. You need to know. Now, before I teach this lesson today, I want you to say that was a fantastic lesson, Pastor. Thank you, because I'm not sure you'll say it afterwards, so I want to make sure that you say it ahead of time. Because the name of the title is The Joy of Correction. Whew, did you feel like the, just the wind was sucked out of the room right there? It's like, really? It's the joy of correction. All right, let's talk about this. Uh, you know, people don't like to be corrected. Did you know that? But if I asked you if you ever are wrong about anything, what would you say? Yes. Are you perfect? No then why do we not like or realize we need correction sometimes? And let's just kind of change the atmosphere. Let's, instead of saying correction, let's say coaching. We just need to be moved the right way, okay? Proverbs chapter 13, verse 18. A person who refuses correction will end up poor and disgraced, but the one who accepts correction will be honored. Good enough. We can close service right now. Refuses corrections, ends up poor and disgraced. Hmm. Psalms chapter 23, David's psalm. I'm reading out of the NIV version. You've memorized the King James version, so let me just read here. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley, the darkest valley. See, I'm starting to quote the King James. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and staff, they comfort me. So how many like green pastures? Provision. You like that? Fantastic. Well, let's see. The next thing, quiet waters. How many like peace? Good. You're all signing up. How about uh, refreshing of your soul? You're emotionally healthy. You're happy. You're, you know, you're full of passion for life. How about uh, being able to make right paths, which would mean right decisions? How many like to make right decisions all the time? Uh, It's getting better, isn't it? How many like to be safe in a dangerous world, knowing that God's there to help and protect you? Okay. You all said yes, which means you signed up for the staff and the rod of the shepherd. What is the staff? That's the shepherd leading. But what's the rod? If you know much about sheep, the sheep kind of wander, don't they? And the, the rod is, you know... You know, little sheep's no over this way. Kind of shepherd leads, but the rod kind of keeps them on the path, right? And the Bible says, your staff and your rod, they what? Comfort. How many, well, I should say it this way. How many don't trust yourself? All of you should say yes. Because you don't know everything. I need God. How about you? I need the Holy Spirit to tell me and help me. I mean, if I'm going to fall off a cliff, wouldn't you want someone to tell you? Yeah, we need help. And we need to celebrate the fact that it is the staff and the rod. We need to celebrate that. Amen. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5 and 6. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone. Say, I'm an everyone. Everyone he accepts as a son or a daughter. So every son and daughter is going to be corrected. Right? They're going to be trained. 
Here's the key. A son and daughter that receives father's in, uh, correction enjoys the inheritance. Follow that? Sons and daughters receive the inheritance. If you want to be a son or daughter of the house, you're going to hear his voice and you're going to be quick to obey it. And God has to train you to do that. That's what it means. He's going to chasten, he's going to correct you as a son and daughter to be obedient to his voice so that you can inherit all that he has for your life. Very, very important. Write this down. We have a wrong perception of correction. As I said, we should change the word to coaching because we take it as condemnation. We take it as something wrong with us. That's not true. God's correction is not to make you feel bad about yourself. It's to help you get where you need to get. And so write this down. The only way to promotion, the only way to promotion is correction, either spiritually or in the natural. We all have to be humble and to continue learning if we expect to advance in life. Is that right? Come on, help me out. Is that right? Yeah, exactly right. So let's continue. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 32, New Century Version. Those who refuse correction hate themselves, but those who accept correction gain understanding. Wow, they hate themselves? They have a future of poverty. They hate themselves if they don't receive correction. So we need to talk about this. I remember back in the early days of the church, we had a young man who was involved with ministry. He wasn't on staff, but he had a lovely family, I think five or six children, and he could never hold a job. And it was always a puzzle to us on staff because we felt bad for the wife and the kids. This guy would, you know, he'd have a job, he'd have a job, and he'd have a job, he'd never hold a job. So he had a skill set, and we found a job that matched his skill set, and we, he hooked him up with this guy, and they hired him. Going great. Two weeks later, he walks into church and says, hey, I quit that job. I said, wait, <laughs> I didn't hear that right. What'd you say? You quit the job that we found for you? You know, you, you, you have another job? No, I don't have a job. I quit that job. Okay, help me understand. You quit this job. Why did you quit this job? Well, I got done with my assignment on Friday and they asked me to sweep the floors. I didn't sign up for sweeping floors. I'm thinking, oh, Jesus. <laughs> you know what's going to happen to that young man? He'll be sweeping floors the rest of his life. I knew I was in charge. I knew I was ahead of him. Amazing. Listen, when you agree to be an employee, you give your life away. We live in a culture that doesn't like to submit to anything. But when you sign up to be an employee, you are under the authority and the trust of an employer. Is that correct? And you are hired under that trust to do a function just as the employer wants you to do it. Is that right? It's pretty common, right? You may not agree with it. You may think you have a better plan. You may think you have more experience. You may think you know better, but you're not hired there to constantly kick against what the employer wants. Obviously, you can give advice. You can give input, obviously. But the bottom line is you are under authority, period. Now, you don't have to work there, but if you agree to work there, you're under authority. And your whole goal should be that employer makes money and that company wins in life. And you are there to serve that employer. This is going over really well, I can tell. <laughs> First Timothy chapter 3, verse 8, Paul, telling Pastor Timothy how to pick leaders, says, in the same way, deacons are to be worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. They must, not an option, must what? First be tested. And if there's nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. What is the test? Is it a question answer sheet that references their resume? So on so and so date, you worked here? No. I found out resumes don't do a whole lot for me. I'm sorry. <laughs> I've been around long enough. 
What's the test? The test doesn't happen until you ask the employee to do something he does not want to do or he does not want to do it the way you've asked him to do it. That is the test. If he does it with an attitude of respect and honor without complaining, that is the test. Because if he does not respect authority at that level, you do not want to promote him into more responsibility. I should have a lot of clap. At least the employer should be clapping right now. Listen, we live in a culture that despises anything that is serving. You know, I'm in this job just to get to somewhere else. I don't like this job. I, I, you know, standing at the time clock 30 minutes before it's time to close, having to be told to sweep the floors, being late most of the time. Attitude is negative. Your friends know how you love the job. I hate the job. I don't want to go to work today. Friend, you're going to be at that job for a long time or one just like it. <laughs> 